Goose, you talk you up as much as possible. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. Uh, welcome to the 2021 Intermountain Tribal and Rural Opioid Wellness Summit Breakout Session. This session is titled Addict to Athlete and is presented by Coach Blue Robinson, founder and head coach, and Marissa Robinson, co-founder, athletic director, and CEO of Addict to Athlete. I'm your moderator, Rebecca Wilkie, and I'm available in the chat box anytime. Um, before we get started, I have some housekeeping reminders, which you guys have probably heard. Um, like any other session, this one is being recorded. If you would like to remain anonymous, um, then I will copy and paste the way to um, put your change your name in the chat in the, the in your session. You can also make sure your video is off by clicking the video icon in the bottom left corner of your screen. If your video is off, there will be a red diagonal line in through the icon. If you need assistance with this process, let me know. I'm willing to help you, um, Wendy, as well. If you have any other questions, use the raise hand function as well, and we can get to you. So now to introduce our wonderful people. I just have, there's two. Let me make sure I have all the bio. Lou Robinson is a well-known clinical mental health counselor and a substance use disorder counselor and the founder of Addict to Athlete. He has specialized in addiction treatment and is passionate about helping others. Lou has worked in the field of counseling and recovery since 2001, working with youth and adults as they turn the mess of addiction into the message of recovery. Lou is widely known in the recovery community, a pioneer in the addiction recovery field, an inspirational speaker and innovator. Lou possesses the ability to motivate people to reach great heights of performance and success in leadership and motivation. With passion, purpose, listening, and meaning, he helps erase addiction, and replace that void left behind with talents of an inspirational athlete. He's raced multiple marathons, ultra cycling events, triathlons, and ultra marathons. Throughout each of these experiences, he has learned the human spirit is much stronger than we think. And then Marissa is our other one. Marissa Robertson has been a certified therapeutic recreation specialist since 1998. He has worked with individuals with disabilities, at-risk youth, as well as adults. She has worked with individuals struggling with addiction since 2011. Okay, let me get to, since there's both of you, I've got some more information that I have to cover. Uh, so let's do it. Um, as the co-founder of Addict to Athlete, she loves working alongside her husband, helping individuals and families realize they can heal from the painful grasp of addiction. Marissa was a competitive swimmer growing up and was involved in various types of recreation, such as soccer, hiking, water skiing, and rappelling. She loves being outside and trying new things. She gets plenty of time utilizing her recreation degree with their four beautiful children. She believes that through recreation, we are able to find wellness in all aspects of life. So thank you, Lou and Marissa, for being here with us today. We are very excited, and I'll turn the time over to you guys. Wow, I should I should probably record that and listen to it every morning. Be a little inspirational. My gosh, that's 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 more than we deserve. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here with you guys today. Uh, it's Whenever I get a chance to share a little bit about what uh, Team Addict to Athlete and Team Addict to Artists do in our communities, I, I jump on the opportunity. Um, it's a program that literally changes lives. And I want to share that with you as we look at, at um, you know, involving what we do in your communities. <clears throat> um, uh, Marissa will be joining us shortly. She's got mom duties, so she's picking up her kids from from uh, from school. So she'll be here in a minute. But I know that she is a, a big part of us being able to implement addict to athlete. Uh, in that, a lot of the a lot of the relationship things that we do, um, they placate right underneath the uh, the recreational therapy model. And I'm a firm believer that if you have treatment programs and treatment centers out there, um, this needs to be a very uh, a profound and, and, I, and like staunch aspect of treatment because um, I found that moving with clients and getting them going and, and, and moving them from one point to another, physically, emotionally, and mentally and spiritually, um, a lot of growth can come. And so I have a lot of respect for our rec therapists out there. Um, it's kind of a it's kind of a career that, that's dying because a lot of people, you know, they look at, at therapists and, and whatnot, being able to use that modality in therapy. But I think that the role of a recreational therapist is powerful. So she'll join us in a minute. And a lot of the stuff that we do metaphorically comes from some of that rec therapy model. But uh, I'll jump into it. So 
Addict to Athlete, we just celebrated 10 years of operation um, at the 501c3 uh, to help individuals find what I say and I call a more excellent way um, for recovery. Back in 2011, when I started this, it came out of an idea that, that health recreation and, and uh, you know, working out, so to speak, specifically mountain biking, helped me overcome my addiction 25 years ago. And it was that ability for me to, to put something else, that I time into something else that got me on this path of understanding that, that there's more than one pathway to recovery. I was working at the Utah County Division of Substance Abuse in 2011, and uh, I had a, had a bunch of my clients who were um, kind of huddled up around the back of a pickup truck. And as I snuck up on them to see what they were doing, because when you get a bunch of like clients kind of huddled in one place, you're like, ah, they got to be up to no good. So I snuck over there and gave them the, hey guys, what are you doing? And I scared them all. They all turned around. And, and to my astonishment, you guys, they were forging their 12-step sign-off sheets because part of our program at the time was that outside of treatment, they would attend these uh, 12-step community groups. And they had the audacity to like forge their names on there as if they had attended. And I'm like, what are you guys doing, you goofballs? And they were telling me, they said, coach, well, back then they said, blue, um, this doesn't work for us. We love the 12 steps. It works for some people, but for us, we want something different. And it kind of hit me then in 2011 that that was the only thing our community had was 12 step programs. So I took that experience and started thinking, well, what worked for me? And for me, it was, it was recreation. Um, when I was done using substances back in 2000, was it 1996? Um, I had all this money because when I have a job and you're not spending it on stupid things, you have, you have money. And I had to do something with it. So I went out and bought the most expensive mountain bike I could find. And for a while there, it was, it was art. It just leaned up against the wall. And one day after having severed my relationships with friends and some family because of addiction, I got on that stupid bike and pedaled into the foothills here in, in Springville. And uh, I was way up far away and I was lost. And these two guys come up behind me and they're like, you know, they, they said something super profound to me. They said, are you lost? And like, yeah, in more ways than one. And so they said, follow me down. I followed these two mountain bikers down. When I got to the bottom, they're like, hey, if you're going to come back out here, A, get some water, B, get a bike helmet, and you might want to ride in something other than Levi's shorts. And so I got those three tips. I had a mountain bike, went out and got the, the gear to do it. And I started feeling like a mountain biker. And that's when my erase and replace philosophy was born. So I knew it worked for me as I met my wife and her family. They were avid athletes. They, they participated in marathons. In fact, my first experience with marathon was running with my father-in-law, having made that promise as a stipulation for marriage. When I asked them if I could marry their daughter, he said, yeah, totally. As long as you can run a marathon with me. And I'm like, sign me up. Had no idea what it was. Um, 26.2 mile commitment there and training for this first marathon I ever did in 2000 was amazing because I started running with my, my, my future father-in-law and growing up, not having a father, he felt, he filled that void of me now having someone to mentor and look after. And as we would run, we would talk and we got into some amazing conversations and as all that processed and added to athlete kind of started to form its, its, uh, its inception, um, I approached my bosses at Utah County and said, I got an idea. I want to take five athletes, five people in my groups, right? Because I was a daytime therapist. And I want to train them to compete in a, in a couch to 5K program. For those that don't know, the Couch to 5K is a program where you start slowly and, and through time and effort and, and working out, you can get up to running a 5K, 3.1 miles. And so my bosses, thank heaven, uh, one was Bruce Chandler in Utah County. He was a former rec therapist. So he gave me his blessing. Um, a lot of other ones were like, be careful. These are lifelong drug addicts. They're going to probably kill over. And I'm like, that's fine. I know CPR. I've got their backs, right? So I went down to my group and I said, hey, who wants to try this? And only five people raised their hands, five, four, girl, four, four guys and one girl. And I said, we're going to meet early every morning. We're going to stretch. We're going to go over some techniques and we're going to go run. We're going to train for this 5k. And it just so happened that this 5k we chose started literally right out the front door of our, of our program on university Avenue in, in Provo. Long story short, we trained for this, this, this uh, 5k, the day that the, the race came, um, uh, it was the gimmick race. It was called chase the mayor. Back then, John Curtis was the mayor of Provo. They gave him a, 
a five minute or two minute head start. And then the, the pack of runners was supposed to go and catch him. And to this day, I'm not sure what you were supposed to do when you caught the mayor, maybe slap him on the behind and tell him he's doing a great job. I don't know, but that was the gimmick. We signed up for it because it was conveniently located. They gave them the, 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 the go ahead right before we started. Um, one of my athletes, he, he handed out these shirts that said addict to athlete. And I was nervous because we're taught and we were taught that this stuff has to be and remain anonymous that by no means necessary, especially in 2011, were we supposed to talk about our addictions outside of a very closed room? And my mindset was, crap, I'm responsible for you guys. If people in the community now know that you're an addict, I could get fired. And they're like, blue, whatever. They're like, we are happy and we're proud of what we're doing. We appreciate this name. We're going to show it off. And so they put these jerseys on that said addict to athlete. The mayor took off at the gun at the gunshot. Then the athletes ran after him and all but one caught the, the mayor. But the coolest thing happened that have they not had put those jerseys on identifying themselves as addicts turning into athletes, I don't think our team would be here because when the athletes passed the mayor, he said, hey, whoa, 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 what's what's that name on your shirt, Addict to Athlete? And now we have, for the first time on Team Addict to Athlete, a member of the team um, speaking highly about his recovery, speaking to the mayor of Provo about his heroin addiction, about this program that's helping reshape their lives, that's, that's allowing them to erase the stigma of an addict and replace it with athlete. And the mayor had that conversation with the three other guys that caught him. And they were proud of it. When these athletes finished the race, I was over the moon. I thought, well, that was cool experience. It will be good for those who participated. Little did I know that uh, after the mayor contacted uh, the county commissioners and found out where the program was located, he, he said he appreciated being caught by, by people um, with that caliber of, of enthusiasm and that caliber of change. And that's how Addict to Athlete was created. It was because Mayor John Curtis felt something when those athletes were talking about their recovery. I like to think that he was kind of upset that maybe a bunch of ex-heroin addicts were, were beating him in a race. They caught him in two minutes. But it was amazing because he gave us a green light. So in 2011, it was it was formed. And uh, ever since then, we went from five athletes now into probably about 6,000 plus athletes throughout the state and throughout the country. Um, we found real fast that Addict to Athlete was only a, a part of what we were going to do. We also inst inst instituted a uh, program called Addict to Artist where we started having people become vulnerable through their art, whether it's music, um, written expression, paint, um, sculpture, what have you. And I realized the vulnerability that people put themselves in when they demonstrate something of theirs. And when we had our very first show with our Addict to Artist team, um, they would put their photography and their paintings up and then people would come in and criticize them, right? I mean, that's what, that's what, that's what art critics do. And I didn't realize how significant that aspect was with the artists about here's a piece of me that I created. I'm hanging it on a wall. Please be gentle. And that program has taken off and done amazing things. We noticed real quick with Team Addict to Athlete that we started having people bring their children with them. Um, and I'm not going to knock other groups, but the most amazing thing was is that our meetings are structured such that they are positive um, like, like conversations. We talk about the power and the, and, the, and the strength of recovery, not war storing or staying stuck in the past. And so people started bringing their children there because the language was clean. No one was out smoking and drinking after the meeting because everyone grabbed your running shoes. We're going for a run. We're going for a workout. And so they started bringing their kids. And I started noticing how much of a compliment that was. So we started seeing the need to, to uh, start a minor league of team addict athlete, the 18 year and younger group. And the goal with the minor league is to support those kids who are the children of the people seeking recovery because addiction rips those families apart and they forget how to recreate together. We found that recreating with family gives opportunities for them to conversate and talk and to rebuild and to heal. And I'll, we'll get into that later on in the presentation, but what this does and what it has done has also established what we call the home team. This is the family system that now begins to heal together instead of just recover. And amazing things have happened that we've seen over the last 10 years by which we've been able to see these people who, who society would call addicts. And I don't allow my athletes to call themselves addicts. It's a part of them. It's not who they are. And that rubs some people the wrong way. And I understand, but that's, that's another program. We don't, we don't focus on any of that negative behavior because you're moving. 
because you move from addict to athlete, to father, to mother, to daughter, to son, so on and so forth, scholar, you know, uh, um, artist, whatever, you build on these things. And so that was how we found the more excellent way. Oh, you're muted, Blue. Unmute. All right. Sorry about that. I get too excited to start pushing buttons. You know how that goes. So in 2011, we started, we found another pathway for the community. We called it our erase and replace philosophy. The erase and replace philosophy basically meant if you're going to erase the addiction, you have to replace it with things of greater value, meaning multiple. We, uh, we still get hit quite frequently with the understanding that people think that all we do is run. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a huge misconception because a lot of us think that a lot of people early on thought that we would be cross addicting because you can become addicted to working out and those kind of things. Um, although I could probably debate that, you know, being healthy and recreating and doing those things is much better than what we used to do. But erase and replace of things of greater value mean that there's more than one attribute that fills the void left behind. So it's service, it's, it's participation, it's leadership, it's family restructure, it's all these things that go into replacing that void in, in that void that was you know, once occupied by addiction. We talk about turning the mess into the message a lot because each one of these people that I've had the privilege of coaching, working with throughout my therapeutic career, I found have been able to share a story that inspires people. It's like the underdog story, the, the story we all love. It's like Rudy, right? Back in the day, we love the underdog stories. I found that when you can metaphorically experience growth and change by becoming a, a world-class athlete. Um, you can leave that world-class addict behind. And when you share that, you inspire others. It's why those, those athletes early on with, with, coach, uh, with, uh, with Mayor Curtis felt inspired to share. And so we are very much not anonymous. Um, again, in 2011, we were shunned because of that because we were doing it wrong. We had other group members from other groups come in and say that we're doing it wrong. And we had to kind of say, hey, look, we're not a replacement for your, your meetings. We are just an addition to. And by doing so, we were able to establish balance because we volunteer, they recreate, um, they, they do much more than just running. And so the goal of all this, everyone, was to eliminate the stigma of what an addict is and what an addict was. And I, and I believe after 10 years now, we, we're starting to make a little bit of, a, of headroom on that. So I want to share with you this little thing. This is what we do when ever we get an artist or an athlete that wants to step up to the plate and become part of the team. Um, a lot of times this goes in company with someone who's in recovery. Maybe they are starting treatment outpatient or something, maybe even inpatient. Um, more often than not, what happens we find is that when people join the team while they're in treatment, they stay after treatment. We have a very large post-treatment retention, which has blown my mind we still keep tabs on those first five athletes from way back in 2011 who still contact the team. And it's been amazing to see what that does. Um, so what I say when someone wants to join the team, and it's not just, you know, to, to, to run and jump and to do cool things. It's, it's really to enhance your recovery process. So we always say you have to choose your starting line. When's your now? You have to take your mark in order to leave your mark is what we say. Meaning it's time to walk out of the shadows and now it's time to take your place to become something that you might not have thought possible. Most people join the team and they don't think that they're athletes. Um, and that's the cool part about it is we have athletes that have participated in ultra marathons. We're talking 100, 150 mile races. Um, and we have those who, who can walk maybe a 5K. I've seen our strong athletes walk with the newcomers. Um, because it's that coaching mentality that we'll get into. So we talk about choosing your own path and to make your own decision. And I say, are you ready? Much like you would at a race. Athletes, take your mark, you know, get set and get ready to go. But then the biggest powerful, most, most amazing part of this is what do you want as a result of being on this team? Because once you step across that starting line, there's no going back. Um, I chose this picture here 
Sorry. You guys got to know something about Coach Blue here is I'm an emotional wreck when I talk about this because there's been so many amazing things that have happened. This was a, a race in 2014. This is a starting line of the village run in Orem. And these shoes should have been filled with one of my athletes named Hayden Johnson. Um, we got him these shoes to run with us, but just days before he was to take his mark, um, he lost his battle to addiction. And we left his shoes there at, at the starting line to represent that there was a fallen athlete. And Hayden's family came and they, they, they were so overwhelmed with the love that this team had for his son that uh, they joined us and, and ran even though they weren't prepared. We talk about this all the time, that those shoes should have experienced what we experienced, but because Hayden made a decision to take a knee instead of to take his mark, he didn't get to have the opportunity. It was a, a powerful visual for the athletes to understand that once they leave that addiction behind, there's no going back and they commit themselves. Now we'll talk about relapse and what happens on the team if someone relapse. We don't look at a relapse as being uh, uh, getting kicked off the team or whatnot. We look at it as what are you gonna do with it now? Um, and so this was a hard one for the team because um, there was an athlete there that should have started with them that didn't. So they know that when they get ready to go, and this isn't just a race. This is, are you ready to change your life to literally leave the addict behind and convince yourself through your efforts that you are now an athlete? And we don't care about how long it takes you to run a race. We don't care about, you know, if you're coming in dead last, all we care about is, are you ready to take your mark and start? No one on Team Addict Athlete ever finishes alone. We've had many people in a race that have been at the very back of the pack. And the beautiful thing about that is that the teammates who finished go back out on the course and run them in so that no one will ever know that they're alone. So it's one of the most amazing things. But I say, if you're getting ready to start this race, you're getting ready to, to literally move away from it. So in order to do this, we've got to let them kind of reframe the way that they feel about themselves, whether it's the addict to artist, addict to athlete, minor league, or the home team, is that we have to let go of the negative attribute of addict. Um, there's, a, there's an unwritten rule that happens on team addict to athlete that when any, ever someone says in the presence of our athletes, athletes, who am I? The athletes in unison will, will, will yell uh, at the top of their lungs, I'm a champion. That's how I feel about these people. These people have gone through some heavy, heavy experiences. You guys know this. Um, they are champions, yet they don't feel like it because their victories are not seen by the masses. And so I say many will start and some will surrender, yet the strong will survive as long as you, as long as you, uh, you don't let uh, all that rough stuff you're going through beat you. You are a champion. So in order to do that, we have them take on what's called the champion's challenge. First and foremost, before anyone starts on the team or uh, the artist group, do they have a why? You would be surprised at how many of these folks that we work with don't understand or know what the why is. Identifying the why behind the action will help them perform in ways well beyond athleticism, and it'll help them find the motivation for them to uh, have uh, experiences that are a little bit easier on days when they're feeling less than inspired. So I look at this about what's your why. You'll hear this a lot when people say, hey, I'm a marathon runner. And someone in the group will say, why do you run? It is one of the most amazing questions once you uh, realize it can be answered. Now, some of this stuff is, is quite amazing. You're looking at a young man that I worked with years ago. Um, who is running these flags after having run the county to county relay that started in, in Jewab County and ran to the Salt Lake Capitol building. He carried that flag promoting his, his recovery, but also as a team. And when they arrived there for the rally of recovery, um, they were cheered for what they had done. And he walked over to me afterwards and said, that's the most amazing feeling I've ever had in my life. Yet it was the hardest thing I ever had in my life. It hurt. And I pulled him aside and I said, brother, I know that it hurt. And this is the cool thing about addict to athlete and me being able to be a therapy and a therapist and a coach is I can pull him aside and I can say, I know it hurt. 
I know it hurt running up the hill. If you've ever been to the Capitol building, you'll know that thing's not on flat ground. You have to run uphill to get to it. And it burns. Having have run almost 65 miles, it kind of hurts. The last part of that's rough. And he said, it hurt. And I wanted to give up. And I said, I know it hurt. But it did it hurt as bad as when that, that, that sheriff put, took those handcuffs off, pushed you into the cell, and the jail door hit, slammed behind you. How bad did that hurt? And he looked at me and says, that really hurt. And he said, you're right. It doesn't compare to that pain. These athletes, these people in recovery, they've already gone through the hard stuff. They know pain. And so I think that's what makes them amazing athletes is that they can struggle and push through the pain that they're feeling. And then at the end, because of what, what uh, I've come to understand is EMDR therapy, they don't even realize it, but what they're doing as they're running, working out and training is they're processing their own stuff. Because like it or not, even if you're, you know, I'm trained in EMDR and if I'm, you know, wagging my finger in front of people and we're processing stuff, this works a thousand times better because as they're moving, as they're walking, they bring it up themselves. They leave it behind. Many times on these runs, the why will have them write something on the bottom of their shoe they want to let go of. Why am I running? Because I want to let go of the pain I had with my stepfather. So the right stepfather on their shoe. And then they'll go run. And guess what happens at the end of the run when they take their shoe off and look at it? It's gone. It's a metaphor for letting it go. And so that why is, is super important. What I've discovered is that the why on Team Active Athlete isn't so much, you know, the medals that you get or the, the t-shirts you get. It's the feeling you have after accomplishing something that you didn't think possible, much like what our athlete here did. So here's the challenge. And this is going to be for everyone who's in this room today. If, uh, if, you, if you agree to all this, congratulations, you're on Team Addict Athlete. We call this the Champions Challenge. I learned this from Coach Larry Gelwex, which is a very powerful, influential man uh, that, that works with the Highland Rugby football team. Um, the challenge that we start off with for anybody that comes on, either the athletes or the artists, is that we teach them to do it even if it's not your job. Now, what I mean by that is when a situation comes up or a problem, um, can you fill, fill that void? That's the reason Team Addict to Athlete and Addict to Artist work in the first place is we found a void in our community. We created something to fill it. Even if it's not your mess, step up to the plate. Every principle found here is taking personal responsibility for ourselves. And it begins without those butterflies inside and that butterfly effect, which makes small actions lead to bigger ones. I want you to pay particular attention if you can see these three pictures here. This was a situation when, when I was working at a residential treatment center that I owned several years ago. Um, two of my, my group members had brothers who both passed away due to substance use. One of them was buried in the Spanish Fork Cemetery. The other was buried in Mount Pleasant. And as they were talking and as we were doing this in group, they started sharing experiences about their brothers and how they were one year apart but they died almost, almost on the same day. It was like, it was like several days, you know, in between one of those, one of those uh, group members, brother passed away in 2011. And this was 2017 and his family had not been able to afford a headstone for, for his, for his site. And as I was sitting there listening to their stories, my mind starts getting into the do it, even if it's not your job. And so I said, hey, I have an idea. What if you trust Team Medic to Athlete to help fundraise and raise money to get your brother a headstone? And she's like, oh, you guys don't have to. I'm like, well, what if we want to? It was one of the most amazing things because as we combined both of their ages, it added, it added up to 62 years. They were both in their 30s, early 30s when they passed away. From the cemetery where her brother was buried without a marker, to the other athlete's brother in Mount Pleasant was exactly 62 miles. And so this group who had never run before decided to run for their recovery, run with purpose to raise money for this headstone. And they turned that mess into a message and we were able to buy a, a proper marker for her brother because her brother didn't want to pass away as an addict. And not having something there to, mo to mark this, this young man was a disgrace. 
And so we do it even if it's not our job. And that's where our athletes stand out with helping in the community by serving their community. I don't have time to tell you how much we do on Team Addict to Athlete, but this is a very small, small idea. And when we finished the top pitchers, you know, where we, uh, we started and the bottom pitcher is, is where we ended, we actually accumulated a lot more people. And it begins with them understanding that principle, do it even if it's not your job. Because when people in recovery start serving out of their inconvenience, they start feeling the power of being needed. And so it was a beautiful experience. The second one with the challenge is we teach our athletes, our artists, all those who participate, the minor league and, and beyond, to treat people they don't need with respect. Now, this is a big idea. This is a huge thing. There are real people behind every and all interactions, um, and we will influence them for, for, for positive or for negative. That's why there's an unwritten rule on the team that if you're ever in an addict to athlete jersey, you don't do stupid things because people know who you belong to. We've actually had a guy who once uh, had to go into to jail to be booked because of an outstanding warrant. He hadn't done anything wrong, but just had neglected a date. And when he walked in and had his addict to athlete jersey on, one of the sheriffs who knew team addict to athlete said, you're going to want to turn that shirt inside out because of Coach Blue sees this, you're going to get benched. And so I have a very proud picture of him wearing his addict to athlete jer jersey inside out. But treating people that you don't need with respect looks like this. This, this picture here um, is of Rob and Tyson Rich and Rob's wife, Stephanie. And they're pushing a very special soul. This is Emma. Team Addict to Athletes several years ago raised money through charitable donations and through our efforts to purchase a Hoyt racing chair. That racing chair cost about $8,000. And when we were first presented with this to like, to like buy this racing wheelchair, so that we could push and race with these kids who have disabilities, it was, it was mind blowing. See, Emma was born to a drug addicted family and she is legally blind, she's legally deaf, and she has mental delays that have made it hard for her to participate in, in life. One thing their family realized real quick was, I wanna find out why these people, these addicts treat family members like this. Who could use substances during a pregnancy and hurt this innocent child? And so Emma's parents came to our meetings to kind of find out what kind of horrible people they would find, but they found something very different. They found that these people, these addicts were actually very amazing people who didn't know how to cope with pain, who didn't know how to cope with trauma. And so they used. And so she came and started understanding the principle behind forgiveness. When she approached, uh, when we approached her and said, we want to give Emma a racing chair and let our athletes push her. I can't imagine a mother letting us people, addicts push their daughter. I mean, talk about precious cargo. Rob, who's in that, or sorry, Tyson, who's in that red jersey, actually flew a couple years ago out to run the Marine Corps Marathon, which is a very prestigious uh, marathon, and was able to push Emma with the Challenge Athlete Foundation with KPZ. And talk about amazing. Whenever you get the opportunity to push Emma, you have angel wings pushing right behind you. Because it's a very real, I guess, I guess mindset and, and perspective of, treating people we don't think we need with respect because her parents trusted us enough. So we teach that with our athletes and our artists to not look at say DCFS as the bad guy or the judge or the police, but to treat them with respect because we might need them one day. This is a big one because there's a lot of people that have hurt one another out there, but if we can learn to treat them with respect, that champion can kind of start to flourish. So we talk about going for the win on a daily basis on Team Addict to Athlete, Team Addict to Artist. Going for the win. It's an acronym for what's important right now. So this picture that you see here is kind of a, a beautiful thing. This is our Telluride, Colorado chapter of Addict to Athlete. And these people, my athletes and some of the Colorado athletes, are standing on top of um, Mount, Wilson. Mount Wilson, Wilson Peak. For those of you guys that don't know, Wilson Peak is the, uh, the mountain depicted on the Coors Light beer can. It's in Colorado. 
our athletes climbed and conquered even that demon. And this is a picture of them standing on top of that mountain. What a metaphor to go for a win. And it's not an easy hike. I mean, you can see there's not a cloud in the sky. It's almost like they're in space. But they climbed that mountain and overcome. The man in the middle is a recovering alcoholic. And so you see that he was able to overcome something so monumental, so inspirational, that he's like, I've been to the top of that mountain now. It doesn't have any control over me. I went for the win today. So when we start a race or before that gun fires, it's inappropriate for us to think of the finish line, right? We focus on what's coming right now. Just like hiking that mountain, if all they were worried about was the destination at the top, they'd miss so much in between because it's not easy to get there. So much can happen in, in recovery, in life, between when that gun fires to start your race of life to that finish line that it's inappropriate to think that far down the road. So we talk about go for what's important right now, and truly be in the moment. This will be always be a special thing for me. In fact, we're going to be having a bunch of athletes do that again this August. Um, and I'm hoping to join them this time because what an amazing experience that is. So I like this a lot. This is a big one, especially for people in recovery. On Team Act to Athlete, Team Act to Artist, we talk about know what kind of person you are when no one's watching. And you make that decision. I tell my athletes, you make that decision right now. What kind of person are you? when no one's watching? Are you that kind that maybe sneaks onto the computer and starts pulling up some pornography? Are you that person that uh, swings by the liquor store just to get something to hold you over? What kind of person are you when no one's watching? Because nothing hit me, you know, Coach Blue as hard as that when I was out at a, a race in Elko, Nevada. This is one of our, our, our coaches of Elko, Nevada. And he had an amazing little event here. This is called the Ruby, um, Ruby Marathon, Mount Ruby Marathon. So it was an out and back. Each, each athlete, a team of eight, we had to run out to a certain pot, spot and come back and then the next one would go. I didn't realize this, but they put me in one of the hardest, longest loops. And I was running away, going up there. And I'm like, this thing's never going to end. And then it hit me. I could totally cheat right now. No one's really going to care if I made it to the turnaround point. Shoot, there might not even be anybody there to even log me in. If I turn around now and go back, I can save some energy and save some of the pain that I'm going through um, for my last leg. And I, I, you guys, I seriously, I looked up and I saw a runner who was cresting over the hill. Uh, I had just run maybe about six miles and I'm like, I'm just going to wait till he pops over and I'm turning around. But as I was walking with him, I, I saw that he never really did quite pop over the mountain. And then pretty soon I was at the spot where I was watching him pop over the mountain and I had made it. And then it hit me, coach, what kind of person are you if you do this? Practice what you preach, man. And I'm like, I, I, I can't. I have to keep going. And as I crested that mountain, the outrunner was coming back, and I, I ran the other half mile out and back. But it even shook me, you guys, as the coach who knows better, that I was tempted to cheat. And no one would have known, but I would have. And it was one of those things where I'm like, if I can still fall victim to this just because of my own like fears and anxieties, they're going to as well. So it really is kind of about that personal understanding uh, on Team Addict to Athlete about knowing who you are when no one's watching. So this is an interesting thing. Now, you're gonna, I mean, I told you, coach, I cry a lot and this is gonna be hard for me. We teach and coach on Team Addict to Athlete and Team Addict to Artists that we do not allow or, or, or really conceptualize loss. That sounds, sounds weird, right? I tell my athletes, losing is not an option here, guys. Because losing means that you went out onto the field of play, maybe it's life, maybe it's a relapse, and you, you, got, you lost. You didn't give everything you got. You still had stuff in the tank, but you didn't use it. You lost. But getting beat is very different. Because be, getting beat means that your opponent was simply stronger than you today that you gave it everything you had. You gave it, you gave it all, all of your coping skills. You gave it all of your excuses. You gave it all of your strength, your spirituality. You gave it all, and it got you. Losing is not an option, but getting beat, we understand. We've lost teammates on Team Addict to Athlete. We've lost members of this team through, through, uh, through overdose and through, through substance use. 
And um, it's never easy, you know, when they take a knee and they lose their battle. But this is a different story. This picture here is of my right-hand man. This is my assistant coach of the whole team. His name is Jed Jensen. And Jed and I go way back. Um, it's been almost 20 years since I first met Jed when he was a little teen, uh, just about a little 18-year-old roughneck. Um, and over the last 10 years, I've grown super close to him as a friend and as a fellow athlete, as an assistant coach. Jed was running a very difficult race here. This is the salt, this is the bad water Salton Sea run. It's a 82 mile run that's in the deserts of uh, California. And Jed gave up the ghost here. And I had to sit and tell him that he was done. And watching him look at me and try to throw in the try not to throw in the towel when I'm like, you're not healthy to do this. Look, you're not losing today, Jed. You're getting beat. The, the heat beats you, your nutrition beat you, the time beat you. Um, it was so hard for him because he's like, I'm doing this for a reason. We were running as proxy for a very special athlete who lost her battle to addiction. Her name was Carly. Tyson Rich, the guy in the red shirt I showed you that's pushing Emma, that was Carly's dad. And Rob, the guy in the white, that was Carly's uncle. Carly's dad was running with, with, uh, with Jed and it just so happened to be Carly's birthday. And so Jed having have to, to get beat by this event was more than he could take, but it was awesome because the coach turned back into the therapist and I was able to talk to him about the difference between losing and getting beat that day. His opponent was just stronger than him. That was all, but that's the same way we teach principles inside addict to athlete. If we have an athlete that relapses, never would I, dismiss or kick up an athlete off of my team if they relapse. So many programs I've worked for, even when I owned a treatment center before I sold it to get out of the industry, so many would kick people out because they got beat, because they exhibited parts of addiction in their presence. And instead of taking the harder route, which is digging deeper, sometimes it's easier just to kick them out. I don't agree with that. It's harder. It takes more time. It takes more accountability. But we suffer together. We go through it together. Jed was having a real hard time here. And last night, this is three years later, last night in my meeting that we had for Team Addict Athlete, he approached me and said, I still have difficulty with that. When you race an event, and if you don't finish, on the official record, you get next to your name in the event, the acronym DNF which means did not finish. Jed takes that to heart. We talk about DNFs are, are, are okay. We, they make sense. But never do we go for DNSs, did not start. What you don't know is that this is at mile 38. He was halfway there, 38 miles in the desert. That's pretty amazing. And so it's about showing him what he's accomplished. And I know that we're gonna be back down in that desert again because he needs to take his mark again and we'll be right there with him. Having learned from the experience, learn from the relapse, learn from that loss to come back and, and, and do it again and be successful. I think we learn more obviously from failure than we ever do with success. And that's what I love about Addict to Athlete is it's a real life in the moment metaphor for recovery. There's gonna be good days, there's gonna be bad days, but is your team solid? Is your home team solid? Because at the end of the day, this is what we want to establish with my athletes, with people in recovery. And that is, it's your character versus reputation, which is more important. Think about that for yourself. Is your character more important or is your reputation more important? Most people in addiction come in with a very interesting reputation. But once you peel back those layers, you find that they've got the most amazing character. And a lot of times they're using because their character hurts They've been lied to, manipulated, they've been hurt, they've been traumatized, and then they've had to block themselves in with whatever drug of choice, substance of choice, and that builds a reputation. A champion is solid when establishing their character, and it's the most important part of them. Your reputation will come and go, and there's, real, there's really no value in that reputation. It really is where your character's at. I feel very privileged to be able to point these things out with, with the athletes as we participate there. Team addict to athlete, 
Okay. We go from addict to athlete to coach because inevitably the longer you're on this team, the more value you create, the more it's time for you to step up and help. We offer what's called Addict to Athlete Certified Recovery Coaching. It's a 40-hour intense program to help people become recovery and sober coaches. And it's a peer-to-peer training. Um, It is very intense. It goes over scope of practice. It goes over kind of the tools and the techniques used. It goes over what we've created on the Addict to Athlete playbook so that people all over the country and the state can open chapters of their own using the philosophy with their own kind of interests. We have, we have how many teams now through Utah? Nine. We have nine teams through Utah. Three outside. One in, one in the Utah State Prison and three on the outside of Utah throughout the country and more to come. We're looking to open one in Huntington Beach, California soon. This peer-to-peer training helps put people who were once addicts into these coaches. What you're looking at is just several of our coaches. Um, you know, we've got, uh, we've got several here. We have some out in Uinta County, Uinta Basin, that's going to be, it's going to be trained and uh, to help out in some of the rural communities. The beautiful thing about this is a team addict athlete works so well in the rural communities because it's something. And uh, Uinta Basin has a very strong chapter. In fact, we all just got back to participating with them as we all jumped out of airplanes over the weekend, which was a horrible decision on my part, but I did it. Very scary. But these guys, they create something and that team becomes the family and that family becomes your community. And when you see someone walking around with an addict athlete shirt or jersey, you know that they have cleared some pretty heavy bars to get where they are. It changes lives, this recovery coaching program. Um, it operates in a way that you can like, learn a- and experience what the team is and have the backing of everyone on the team um, to help you create your, your program. So we have cycling teams and mountain climbing teams and, and skydiving teams now and, and fishing teams and running teams. We have so many things, um, but the core of it is to give back. What do we offer? What does Team Addict Athlete offer? We offer our free community support group. That's something that happens every, every location. They have a, a, a weekly meeting, sometimes more. Community action. We don't just sit idle. We want it to be very much in the public eye. That's why we're not anonymous. Service is off the charts from cleaning up mountain trails to, to working on at aid stations for events, um, you name it. Recreation, we teach them how to recreate, recreate, recreate their lives, training them to become athletes, to become sober coaches, to become parents, you know, coaching in that when they start getting like stuck that we can push them through. We don't have sponsors on Team Addict Athlete. We call them personal trainers. So in other groups, you have a sponsor that you call and kind of check in with. Personal trainers say, grab your shoes, we're going for a hike. Grab your bat, we're going to go hit some balls. Grab your clubs, we're going somewhere. Leadership, we've seen so many of our athletes step up. Family support, establishing that home team. Addict athlete does not separate in our meetings the people who have addictions and the people that don't, right? We're not like an Al-Anon group. We put them together because we felt that they can learn from each other. And that has had tremendous, like, 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 I guess, uh, experiences. We educate them through our, our podcast and through our online uh, recovery resources. Um, families can come in, learn how to communicate, learn how to recreate together. We have a website that is full of resources. Um, and our podcast, we're well into our 200th episode of our podcast with professional athletes, with common athletes, with, with leaders uh, in the industry. And then our charity work. If I had another hour and a half, I would tell you about all of our charity work. Team Addict Athlete raises money for people who struggle. You know, over the past 10 years, we've participated in what's called the, uh, the uh, Santa's Helpers, you know, the Santa's Athletes, where we provide Christmas for our team members and for people in recovery who can't afford it. Um, we've, this last Christmas, I think we served 75-ish kids. That's people who used to be called addicts are now... Santa's elves, R- raising money for people in recovery. We've done you know things uh, everywhere from helping with with um, with uh, sober living to car payments to things that when we when we have money coming in that we can give back. We sponsor the minor league for events. We buy them shoes. We do all kinds of stuff. All encapsulated, we call it extracurricular recovery. This is all the stuff you do beyond 
life. It's the extra stuff that makes it not so much a death sentence, but so much kind of like a way of life. And so that is what we do on Team Addict to Athlete and Team Addict to Artist. It's the way that we inspire people to step out of their comfort zones, to, to, to straighten, I guess, that path into detail, and they can do really hard things. And uh, literally to have them turn the mess into a message. I don't know if we have any questions or what you do now. I think we're we've got right there to the brink of time. I think, yeah, good timing. I speak for everyone that that was a very powerful, powerful session. And I am so glad I, when I got the list of sessions, I am very glad I jumped on this one so fast. I have a large health and wellness and holistic health background. So I am very grateful. I got to moderate this session. Thank so you. I appreciate it. So yeah, we've got about um, five minutes. There are no sessions after this. So if um, we don't really have a time crunch, if anyone has, any questions in the next five minutes um, or anything like that, feel free to ask or any other information that you would like to cover. We do have about, you know, five, 10 minutes that we, you know, that you can, because we do not have any sessions after this. Yeah. Everyone stayed awake then, huh? <laughs> yeah. Through the tears. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it totally, was a I'm very, 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 very powerful Ooh. session. And we really, we really appreciate you being here and sharing um, Thank you. your message. Yeah. It means a lot. But yeah, we're happy to answer any questions you guys might have. You can find all of our resources on our website. It's addicttoathlete.org. Um, all of our contact information is on there, all of our resources and, and whatnot. So it's fairly simple. Awesome. Let's see. Do you have to be an addict to participate in the program? No, that's the beauty of it. I, I love this question more than anything, because again, that was an honor that we found very, very close to the inception of the team where we had people that didn't use it all that came in and participated because everyone knows someone that struggles. We call those people the muggles, right? The non-magic folk, we stole that. We have, in fact, we have just about as many people that don't personally have addictions that participate with the team because they have a loved one. Maybe it's a son or a daughter or a spouse or a family member than we do that have addictions. And that's the beauty of it is we don't, we don't talk about that kind of stuff. Like we don't talk about addictions. We talk about the, 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 the change and the power behind it. It's very motivating. I love it when we have uh, the muggles come and attend because Everyone goes through the same stuff. You know, everyone goes through the same pain. So just because someone chose to use alcohol as a coping mechanism doesn't mean that the person who's never used didn't have the same problems or feelings. They just found a different way to, to cope with it. So we use both of those to help each other and show them that everyone copes with pain and trauma and situations differently. Why separate them when we can have them healed together? So yeah, no, we, we don't. There's a lot of people that don't have addictions that participate. Excellent. Perfect. Um, and I had a couple people ask if these slides will be available. Um, we are recording this session. And so if you do have any questions, please email the Troy Resource Center, everyone, if, if you would like a copy of this as well, where it is recorded and everything. So, and then yeah. Marissa um, posted Marissa at addicttoathlete.org is the email as well um, in the chat, as well as the is addicttoathlete.com backslash support group if you want to find any other um, groups as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's a powerful experience. It really is to, to see these people change and, and to see them out there in the community, um, not afraid to talk about their recovery, not ashamed of it anymore, but to use it as, as dare we say, almost a, a superpower to where they can say, look at what I've done. I've, I've overcome some amazing difficulties to be here. It's, it's they're, they're just neat people. Well, and I feel like that goes very well with what, you know, the reduction of stigma that this whole, whole summit is about. So I feel like you hit, you know, right on the head. Um, any yeah. more questions that anyone has? You're getting many thank yous. I'm sure I can vouch for anyone that hasn't posted. I had personally had chills a couple of times, all that. It was very, very powerful what you shared. Yeah. So just check out our podcast. All of our podcasts are on, on any podcasting network. It's, it's Addict to Athlete. We have lots of neat stories. My daughter and I, she, we do a, a podcast called The Minor League. She's 15 years old and she thinks she's a therapist. And so she talks about teenage issues. And then we have our, our main podcast with Addict to Athlete. And then we have a, a call-in show weekly that you can get on uh, Facebook with us or through Zoom. And uh, it's a, it's a one hour kind of like Q&A. Every week we do it. So check them out. Perfect. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you joining. My us pleasure. And everyone. 
Yeah. Thank yeah, you so we much. Excited. Everyone. And we want to thank, this is pop brought to you by the Utah Department of Human Services Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health, the Rural Health Association of Utah, Utah State University, USU Emma Eccles Jones College of Education, Human Services, Department of Kinesiology and Health Sciences, USU College of Humanities and Social Sciences, USU Extension, and SAMHSA. So they are the reason we were able to put this on today. We really appreciate them. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. It was an honor to be able to, to, to meet with you. Yes, and like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to message me directly or the Tribal and Rural Opioid Initiative Resource Center. Um, we're the ones partially hosting this as well. If you have any questions or want um, any other information, I can direct you to um, the proper channels if needed. So, because obviously it seems like people are very, very interested in this program. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Look forward to meeting you all. Thank you for being here.